Amen. All right. We're talking about a gathered people. The, the power there is when the church of God gathers comes from the word ecclesia, which means the called out ones, the chosen ones in secular Greek. Ecclesia was always meant like a town meeting to conduct business. So when the church gets together, we're conducting kingdom business. We praise and we worship God. The Bible says, let the high praise of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand to execute the vengeance, the written judgment. So we're coming together. We're dealing with the principalities and powers that would oppose the church. And there's a power. That's why many times the devil does everything he can to keep you from coming to church. And I believe coming to church is one of the most important things that you can do. Well, number one, we have a nation where we're free. And we need to exercise that right. You know, if you quit exercising your rights, you lose them. We just finished the biblical citizenship class on Wednesday night and how important it is to understand what the Constitution says and to execute your rights, to exercise your rights. So many people don't even vote, we've learned, in like your, your local and your mayor elections. Over half of the people, for instance, in, uh, in the city of Jackson, when the mayor was elected, not even half of the voters even showed up to vote. So we need to exercise our privilege as Christians. Remember, people in communist countries and oppressive regimes risk their lives just to assemble. So let's not lose fact of the, of the power that comes when we gather ourselves together. Turn to Psalm 133. Psalm 133. This shows us the power of gathering together. Psalm 133. This is a song of ascent. Whenever you see it, a song of ascent, it means that this was like a call to worship. Calling people together to worship. So this was a, a song that they would do when they were entering into worship. David wrote this psalm. He said, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. See, we're coming under Christ. We're coming under his lordship. That's what it means. That's what it means to dwell together in unity. Doesn't mean that we agree on everything because we're never going to agree on everything. I mean, those of you who are married know that husband and wife, you don't agree on everything. If you do, you're lying. Or, or somebody just is absent and doesn't care. But we're coming under the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ. He said, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. That's what we did this morning. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded blessing life forevermore. And I want to focus in on verse three, the dew of Hermon. Hermon is... A mountain in Israel, it has snow caps on the top of it all, all year long. But this is what one commentator described the dew of Hermon. He said, the dew of Hermon and the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion differs entirely from any dew in our country. It is a phenomenon peculiar to Palestine and to the east. It is a soft mist that comes from the Mediterranean during the summer when the heat is greatest and the country is burned up with terrible sunshine. It is attracted by the inland heights and condensed in copious moisture upon their sides and creeps down upon the plains, reviving and refreshing every green thing. It comes first of all to Mount Hermon and helps to keep up its unchanging robe of snow to fill its springs, feed its Caesars, and then it flows down and makes the corn to grow Green in the valley. In other words, this dew, it was very heavy. It was almost like rain and it would descend and it would water everything and give life to everything. So when we come together as a body, we are under the headship of Jesus Christ and his presence, his anointing. We are receiving life as a body. It's something that we cannot receive on our own. Yes, we can have great prayer time on our own, but there's a corporate anointing that is distinct and has a different purpose. It is to feed and give life to everything in the church. And that's why it's church is so Essential. It's an essential. We've got to have it. You've got to survive. You've got to have it to survive as a Christian to be 
revived and have a proper perspective. Sometimes when you get too much on your own, you get off course. That's why we need each other. So we talked about our core values here at Kent Christian Center. Connect with Jesus, connect with your Bible, and connect the gospel to your community. And today I want to talk about, and all all three of those work together and they're synonymous, but today I want to talk about connecting to your Bible. Very important. Very important to read your Bible. So I want you to turn to Deuteronomy. Well, for some reason, that's not in my notes. I know I cut and pasted it in there, but let me get my Bible out. Let's go to the Gospels. Let's go to Matthew. We're going to look at when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Go to Matthew chapter 4, I believe it is. Yes, Matthew chapter 4. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Think about that for a minute. We don't live by bread alone, but we live by the Word of God. Sometimes we don't see things as clearly as we need to. You you know, they tell you, don't go to the grocery store hungry because you will buy everything. Have, have you ever done that? Like you were starving and you went shopping, you went to the grocery store, and you just picked up all kinds of things you normally wouldn't pick up? Well, that's what happens when we're not connecting with our Bible. We begin consuming things that are unhealthy. Now, I love sweets. I have a weakness for sweets. I, I, I could eat sweets all day and Sweets didn't bother me, you know, chocolate cake, chocolate ice cream, everything didn't bother me too much when I was younger. But as I got older, I realized that I would, if I would just binge on a lot of sweets, the next day I would, my joints would be stiff. I would just feel terrible. I'm not saying I never eat sweets, but I had to, I had to, uh, I had to restrict my intake very drastically because it wasn't good for my body. Was the same way spiritually. Now, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Says, He humbled you and let you be hungry. And fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Sometimes God will put you in a state of 
dissatisfaction because he wants you to reach out to him. In fact, the Christian life is never, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, and be at ease. There's always challenges. Is it just me, or is that kind of how it is? It's always something. You get over one thing, and then the next thing you know, another issue pops up. Well, God is allowing you to be dissatisfied because he wants you to understand that we don't live by natural means alone, but we live by the word of God. We live by a spiritual food. That we need to read and we need to strengthen us. You know, why is it? Why is it important? I want you to turn to John chapter one. John chapter one. Now, John was the last of all the apostles to die. He lived up and around till 90 BC. Paul and all the other people had sort of died off after 50 to 60, excuse me, AD. Bible says that John was a disciple whom Jesus loved. He had a special relationship with the Lord while he was here on earth. But he says this, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of men. If Jesus is the word, then we need to get into the Bible. We need to read it. You need to, when you don't feel, when you don't feel like it is the time you really need to read it. Now, they, they've done little studies. I say they, I'm not sure who they are, but I read this somewhere. So it sounded good. Now, that's what I had a professor who always used to say when, you know, when somebody would say, well, they said this. I'd like, well, who are they? Because you always say they, who are they? I don't know. Nobody knows who they are, but, but they have done a few studies and, uh, Make, it make, this makes sense, so I, let's, I just throw this out there. But people that read their Bible at least four or five times a week are happier and more satisfied than people who don't. Now, I say that's probably true because it is in accordance with Scripture, that man does not live by bread alone, but, but, they, but we live by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So if that's true, Jesus said the same thing. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. So in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Nothing came into being. Nothing was created without the word. Now think about that. Nothing was created without the word of God. See, we live in a nation where we're free to have the Bible. You go into other nations and sometimes if, if, if a person gets caught with just a couple of scriptures, they send them to jail for the rest of their lives. But we here in America, we have such a, a privilege to have access to the Bible. So I believe God expects more from us as American Christians. Because unto much is given, much is required. So I promise you, you will never harm yourself by reading too much of the Bible. Now, I can guarantee that. You may harm yourself by eating too much chocolate cake or eating too much ice cream, but you can never harm yourself by reading too much of the Word of God. Now, I can say that with 100% confidence. Man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. How do we know what God says? It's in the Scripture. Remember, when Jesus was in the wilderness, he replied to the devil with, it is written. It is written. So there's a power 
in the word of God. Romans 10 verse 8 says, but what does, this, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are preaching. The word of God, it's right here, but it's got to be activated. I used to know a guy who said, oh yeah, I love the Bible. I kiss it when I walk out the door every day. I'm like, well, do you read it? Well, not really. Well, maybe instead of kissing your Bible when you walk out the door, maybe you ought to open it when you get home and read it. The Word of God. We need to activate it in our lives. We need to understand what it says. There's a power in in obeying the Word of God. Now, we all know what happened in the book of Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Now, I want you to think about this. Well, let me read the Scripture first. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Now, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened in Acts because they obeyed Jesus' command. What if they had disobeyed? Jesus said, do not leave Jerusalem. Gather together, do do not leave Jerusalem. If they had not obeyed that command, it may not have happened. So do you see the power in obeying the word of God, in obeying the commands of the Lord? When we do that, we activate our faith and we are, and we are agreeing with heaven. See, too often we agree with the devil. Well, I'll never be able to do that or that'll never happen or, you know, I'm no good, I'm stupid. Hey, you're, you're, you're just giving the devil fuel to just oppress you. But Jesus said, I say that if, t- if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. How do we know that we're agreeing with God? Because it's in here. See, this is, this, is a hun- this is a 100% will of God for your life, this Bible. And prophecy is good, but prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and consolation. Prophecy is to, it is to validate the Word of God in your life, not to add to it. The source is the Word of God. And there is a power when we do the Word of God. Right? What, what did James say? Turn to James. Now, James was the half-brother of Jesus. James chapter 1, verse 23. No, verse 22. He says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. See, you deceive yourself when you hear the word, but you don't go off and do it. I'm telling you right now, there's a power that is released in your life when you obey the word and when you do the word. I have seen it over and over and over again. Does not mean that your life is going to be perfect or that every situation is just going to be wonderful. No, it means that when you get in those, when you get in a conflict, how many know we're in a war? Paul said, he told Timothy, Suffer hardship as a good soldier. No soldier entangles himself in the affairs of this life. We've got to understand. You know, you may think, well, why? Why is it so hard sometimes? Because you're in a battle. And the devil's trying to fight against what God wants to do in your life. But we're, this is one aspect of the Christian walk. There's many aspects of it. Many facets of the Christian walk like a diamond. But one aspect that we can't get away from is that we're soldiers and we're in a war. But it's a war that we are going to win. 100% guarantee. 
Read Revelation 21, 22. So we've got to take the Word of God and activate it in our lives. We've got to do it. If you're coming against some type of obstacle, it could, maybe it's a, you know, you know there's something coming up and a bill you have to pay and maybe it's something that's a lot more than you're used to and you're, you're like, okay, what do I do here? Well, you need to activate the, God, the Word of God. Philippians, just to give you an example. My God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Psalm, I don't know exactly what this was, but it says, There is no lack for those who fear the Lord. Psalm 37, in a time of famine, the righteous will have an abundance. See, you got to activate, you got to speak the word of God into that situation. Even when you don't see it happening, in fact, Faith is seeing what you don't. Faith is knowing what you don't see. You don't hope in what you see. It's not hope. Hope is when you know you're praying and you know that you know God's going to come through. You speak it forth in faith and you believe it. You believe it 100%. If you need healing in your body, well, there's multitudes of scriptures for our healing. In fact, turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Even if, even if you don't see it, you can activate God's word in your life. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get used to a Bible, but boy, sometimes these pages are hard to separate here. Isaiah 53. Verse 4 says, Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Now, I've been reading a great book on healing. It's called F. F.F. F. Bosworth, Christ the Healer. It's not a new book, but, it, but it's a great book. And when Keith Tusi came, Keith Tusi is the apostolic overseer over our church. Uh, he told me this was the best book on healing ever written. So you might want to get it. I'm reading it, but it's a collection of sermons. Well, in verse 4, the word griefs and sorrows, Bosworth said that these words in every other part of the Hebrew Bible where, where they appear, there they are translated sicknesses and pain. And he feels like that the translators missed it right here when they translate it. So you could say, surely our sicknesses he himself bore and our pain he carried. And then he goes on to say, by our stripes we are healed in verse Five, or by, or by our scourging, by, by his scourging, we are healed. You can throw those into action. I've shared this testimony before, but it's, I want to share it again. I have an eye condition that God has healed me of. It's called keratoconus, where your corneas change shape. And I struggled and struggled for uh, four or five years with my contacts. Now, remember, God can heal you through any means possible. Okay, God can heal you through a doctor. Whatever it takes, you got to be open to how God, and of course, God can heal you simultaneously right there, and you can believe. And then my eye doctor, my eye surgeon, who I see every year, sent me to a new person who was really, whose her specialty is fitting people with my condition that God is healing me of. And so I went to her. It was, it was kind of a long process. It took me about four months going back and forth to actually find the right contact and to get fitted. But now, now I'm still believing for my right eye, but my left eye, now I'm seeing about 2020. I haven't seen 2020 in my left eye in years. So I attribute that 
to the Lord. Now, one day I believe God's going to heal me completely. But you know what? I'll take that. Hey, you give me a, a good contact that I can see and I'm not sitting there squinting. Uh, and, hey, that's the Lord. See, God moved. God bore my diseases, my sicknesses, and he bore my pain. So you can activate God's word. You're going through something that's difficult. Say, Lord, you, you, you said you bore my pain. Please take it. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. My, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, I mean, life is, God is good, but life can have its challenges, right? Let's just not stick our head in the sand here. But he bore our pain. My son just turned 16. He got his license. You know, it's just like, golly, just makes my head spin. And then he went to his first home, homecoming dance last night. And uh, I don't know why, but I was sad. I just felt this sadness. I'm like, this is crazy. Of course, Katie was a chaperone, so there's no worries. But still, I was just like, oh, gosh, this, this hurts. I just, I just can't believe he's getting older. See, but Jesus can even take that pain away from you, right? I feel fine today. It's great. We need to activate the Word of God. Now, getting back to the book of Acts, they were given a command, and they obeyed that command, and that command changed the world. You think about that. You think you don't have influence? Let me tell you something. You take the word of God, you become a doer of the word and you obey it and you're going to change things. Even if it's just a few people, whoever God has placed in your path, you have the power to bring change. Be an influencer. Don't be influenced. Stand strong. Yeah, you may have to speak out. Sometimes people may get mad. You may have to say, well, you know what? There's only two genders. A man is a man and a woman is a woman. I mean, you may, I mean who, who would have thought that would be controversial? But boy, it can be controversial. And Jesus loves everybody who has confusion, but he wants to help you and see you, see you wonderfully and beautifully made the way God created you as a male or a female, that it's a good thing. Jesus didn't, he didn't create you to walk into confusion. See, we, we can share with people in a loving way. Like, look, God's got, God knows, God knows who you are. Let him show you who you are. See, he loves you. So verse 12, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath journey. When they had entered the city, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James. Obviously not Judas Iscariot. These all with one mind, they were focused, were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. So they were there for many days. They were just obeying the command of God. And imagine how they felt. Okay, Jesus said do this, so we're going to do it. First day, we're praying, praying, nothing happens. Second day, nothing happens. Third day, nothing happens. Fourth day, nothing happens. Fifth day, nothing happens. Sixth day, I mean. But they said, hey, Jesus told us to do it. So we're going to do it. See, that's the way that we need to be. Hey, Jesus told me to do it. So we're going to do it. Jesus said, Spare the rod, spoil the child, so we do it. I hated to spank my kids, but I, I did it because the Bible says, I think, I think my, dad, my dad enjoyed it when we were growing up. No, I was just kidding, Dad. <laughs> but I did it because that's what God said. You get married, what does the Bible say? Man, it's on you. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Hey, how does God love you? He loves you unconditionally. So husbands, 
You don't have the liberty to say, well, she doesn't do this. No, she doesn't do that. So I'm not going to do this. A marriage is not a partnership. It's a covenant. It's you give 100 percent. The other person gives 100 percent. No matter what's happening, no matter what's going on, whether it's great times, whether it's bad times. Husbands, you love your wife, period. No, it's no excuses. But I promise you, now, I'm not a perfect husband, but I, I, I think I'm pretty good. Right, Katie? I think. I've, I have a great wife. But I can tell you right now, when I follow the word of God and when I love my wife, when I treat her as God treats me, look, God doesn't smash me down. God doesn't criticize me for every little stupid thing that I do. No, God reaches out to me in love. And I find that when you reach out to your spouse in love and you show that love, it makes your marriage so much better. See, when you get married, that's a time you got to man up. You got to put aside all of what you want to do. And your focus is on your wife, period. That's really a godly picture of marriage. Man, it's a it's a it's a great thing. And. The Bible says that the woman is the glory of the man. So God has given you glory and that's in your wife. But man, you can't live like you're single anymore. Because you're not. Your time is not your own. My time is focused on my wife and wife comes first. I'll say this, your wife comes first. Well, God comes first, then your wife, and then your children. Husbands, your, your wife is your most precious the most precious gift God has ever given you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, I, I heard this said, I, I saw this video. I, th- I thought this was so good. It was Charlie Kirk. I don't know if you heard of Charlie Kirk, but he's been here and there on the videos for the biblical citizenship. But he said this. I never thought about it this way. He said, you know, why, why does the bride get dressed in white and why does the husband get a black tux like he's going to a funeral? And he said, because for the man, it's a death. Death to the single life. Death to looking at other women. I mean, you're, you're, you are assuming a new role and a new responsibility. Husbands, you want your marriage, your marriage to improve? Love your wife like Christ loved the church. Well, she does this and she does that. That's, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. The Bible says to love your wife like Christ loved the church. Now, I'm sure after preaching this, I will be tested severely on what I just said. I'm sure, because it always happens to me. (laughs) And then Katie's like, well, that's not what you preached. Uh, Yeah, you're right. Forgive me. (laughs) See, that's that's the bad thing about being in the pulpit. When I preach something, God, God God tests me on it the next week. It's like, okay, you said that? Well, let's see if you meant it. See, there's a, there's a huge responsibility to be in this pulpit. I just make it look easy. Just teasing. So they waited and they waited and they waited on a command of Jesus. But when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. See, they were still obeying the command of Jesus. They were still together. They didn't see it the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day. They didn't see it. But they kept pressing in and they kept obeying God. And then, bam, suddenly. See, that's what happens in your life. Suddenly's come along, but they're not, they may look like suddenly's to other people, but you yourself know, hey, I've been pressing in and I've been doing the word of God in this area for for a long time, maybe sometimes for years. Look, I prayed for things for years before they finally happened. I'm still praying for things that I've been praying for years, but you know what? I'm going to keep obeying Jesus' commands. I'm going to press in and I know that one day there's going to be a suddenly 
And it may look like it just happened to other people, but I'm going to know the perseverance and the prayer that it took. So you keep on, you keep believing. That, the word believe in the Gospels, more often than that, not it's in the present tense, believing. We have to, we have to stay in a continual state of believing. You can't just believe once. We can't just live on our salvation experience or on our experience when we just got baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, we've got to keep on believing. We've got to keep on pressing in. There's more of God that we need to know. We just touched the surface. We haven't seen anything yet. The older I get, the more I realize I don't know. And I hope that that's called maturity. You know, because when you're younger, you know, you're a teenager, you, you think you know everything. And then you get older and you're like, wow, my parents are pretty smart. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And then the suddenly came from heaven. Every blessing that we receive comes from the Father above. That, that's what James says, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation, there is no change, there is no shadow of turning. James 1.17, every good thing given. Think about that. Every good thing given. Your children, their gifts from God. Hey, there's no guarantee that when you get married, you're going to have kids. But if you have children, they are divine gifts from God Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, Jesus said. See, that's why abortion is so horrible. Because it stops a life that has purpose. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Every good thing given, whether it's a glass of water, whether it's food. When you go home and you eat lunch, you eat dinner, or you go out to eat, whatever you do, you need to thank God that that dinner is from the Lord. Think about it. That's what the Bible says. It comes from God. I'm telling you, if God would have, if God would have removed his hand from our lives just for a second, it would be chaos. But he hasn't. Every good thing given, every perfect gift, Is from above, coming down from the Father of the lights, in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Connect with your Bible. This week, connect with your Bible. Whenever we go through periods of dissatisfaction, it's probably because we're not eating right. We're not eating our spiritual food. Connecting with your Bible, we gain perspective, we gain vision, we gain focus, we gain strength. And when we connect with the, with the Bible, we're connecting with Jesus. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I want to encourage you this week, connect with your Bible. Allow that spiritual food to strengthen you. Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your presence.